Well, it's it's eight o'clock. Let's make a start on this one's conversation. So, Katie, thank you very much for joining us. Let me pin both you and I so that folk can see who's having a conversation. Here we go. Hello, Katie. Thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. Lovely to be here. <laughs> you were just saying you're on the west coast of Ireland. I am. Yes, I am. Um, I started, uh, well, started finishing Toby's journey. Um, so the Irish part, I'm trying to get that done in the next three weeks and I'm here with my kids. I've, I've bundled them off to have dinner so that we can have a nice conversation. And um, otherwise, uh, just, yeah, just launching the kayak in different places, meeting a load of lovely people and um, hopefully, secretly, working on the second book. Wow. Ooh. Amazing. We, we, I, we don't talk about second books because because it's, it's difficult for people because sometimes they think, oh, well, the, Tim, Tim and the author talked about the next book. So that's going to feature. So it, it doubles back on yeah. you. And don't go out and buy it or it doubles back on me. And they say, well, what, I didn't buy that book and you didn't include it in your subscription. Tim, you oh. failed me in your in my, in my quest to read better adventure stories. So, so it doesn't even have a name yet. So it would be out like two years from now. So. Well, yeah. oh, well, what'll be going on then? Who knows? <laughs> in, in these times, who knows? Well, well, it's <laughs> it's, it's fabulous to, to to know that you're carrying on his adventure. So we'll we'll talk a bit about that. So because it's a it's a strange conversation this evening in 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 many ways. You know, we're talking with you, Katie, but you're talking for Toby, um, and we'll yeah. talk about we'll talk about that as well because that's a really really special thing. Um, you know, there's Normally we talk to one remarkable person in these conversations, but this month we're we're we're, we're talking to two. And and as, as as you know, Katie, and and I mentioned it in the letter that goes out with with with, with all the books. So I, I I I came across Toby while he while he was out doing his adventure, not out out there on Instagram, where everyone meets everyone. I I, I I've looked <laughs> into him, and well, I'm a big fan of the shipping forecast. I, 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 I'm a, a little bit of kayaking. I've never really sea kayak. The sea scares me. I can't swim. But I was <laughs> blown away by this lust for life that he had. Um, yeah. But I, I, I wouldn't know. You, you, the way things happen on Instagram, you, you, you keep in touch with people and you lose touch with people. And I hadn't yeah. thought about his passing and, 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 until you, you came on the scene and started talking about the book. So yeah. I felt a real sadness there, but I, I really felt honoured and like this strange sense of privilege that we'd had a chance to have that conversation. And even in that in those brief few chats that we'd had, I could just sense this this incredible spirit of, uh, of an amazing man, which 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 you've done real amazing justice to, I really think. Oh, good. I mean, that's one of the main things that I wanted the book to to sort of communicate to people is this lust for life not in a sort of crazy ditch everything and you know go and do what you want but in a sort of finding joy in in everyday stuff and then and what you can fit in and if you want to go on a big adventure go on a big adventure but if not something smaller and I, I think Toby was he would have he would have got that across over a pint uh with people and and I hope that that sort of comes across in the book as well <laughs> It, it really does. I, and and, and in, in Toby's honour, I, I thought I'd have a, li a little tipple. So I'm sure I'm well, sure. I, now that you've got yours out, look, I've got. <laughs> <laughs> but that's brilliant because I, I loved I, I, I loved that, you know, a lot of the time he would he would land on a remote beach somewhere with a couple of people that he'd only just met. And they would yeah. all toddle off to find a bar, wouldn't they? That, that, yeah. that, that seemed to be the routine. Yeah. Definitely. I also used to have sort of some battled, battered cans of Estrella Galicia or whatever else he'd found along the way. And um, I think with kayaking, you can't drink a lot, but it's actually lovely to have a beer when you've come off the water and especially share a few. If it's been a little bit hairy to be able to share all oh, that, you know, that was difficult, that bit around there. Aren't we glad we're off it now? But wasn't it great when we were there? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that thing about he... he he, he would, you know, I love the story about about him going to the to, to the party dressed dressed as the mermaid, which he'd uh, the, the pirate rather, which he'd take he'd taken the gear with him specially so we could go for a disco. Yeah, after we'd done it. I mean, it, it, he says something in the book about not wanting to to 
to diminish his image as a as a retiring adventurer. <laughs> but I, I I never got that sense of him. He must he must okay. have been a wonderful person to spend time around. Yeah, he was, and he he loved dressing up. You know, like if there was any kind of dressing up party or whatever, he'd be there. And um, there was one that one of his friends was talking about after he died that I hadn't seen the pictures of, but he decided to go to a party once as a fish in a bowl. And in order to be able to, or in a fish tank, in order to be able to do that, he had strapped a table around his shoulders, was walking along with a table strapped to him and then made this tank and his head was the fish. So he's like wearing a fish. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of thing he would do I mean I, he he was he did take kayaking very seriously and and the ways of the sea and all of that but at the same time was able to be very silly and um I think that's a great thing in life isn't it to be able to hold two maybe opposing emotions or opposing um characteristics and be able to have both of them I found it important to be able to hold grief and great sadness, but also to hold joy and be able to go, yeah, let's have some fun here as well. And that's that's so beautifully put. What 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 a nice what a nice thing. And and actually, that being able to hold those things in tension is is wonderfully liberating and empowering because because it, I guess it gives you a balance. You know, not a balance in the in, in the sense that you need a balance for for, for 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 kayaking, but just that balance in life and that and that rounded personality. Yeah, I think sometimes that especially today, we get this idea that we need to be able to define ourselves with four adjectives and that's who we are, that's our identity. But actually we're a lot more complex than that. And it depends on what situation we're in, it depends on you know situation of who we're with, what we're facing. Um, just how things are going for us and sometimes you know things are really hard and things are difficult to deal with and you can't easily have a laugh um, other times maybe they're hard and laughing is a way to overcome it and to get through and there's no rules really I think that that's that's the important thing there's no like oh if you want to get through life you've got to do it like this um, it's I think it's also about encouraging people to just be who they are and go, yeah, you know, I am really sad. I have lost someone important to me, but at the same time, I can go off and have an adventure or I can um, I can be sad at home on my own if I want, or I can go out and have some drinks with some friends. And, you know, there's no, there's no rules, <laughs> I think. And there aren't, are there? And, and, that's, and, and that's, the, that's the joy of being able to, to, to surf the ups, and, the ups and downs of life, I guess, in the way that, that, that Toby with the, the kayak. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about your kayaking and, and his kayaking. You know? well, I think his is um, much more interesting. Mine is rather um, not very skillful. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm sure it's not. But, like, I just got this... I've got a lovely sense of a really warm and connected family. Obviously, you had difficult, very difficult stuff to deal with, but you know the the the, the tales of the, being on the hullabaloo together and being yeah. and him learning to kayak with with with, with his aunt and uncle on, on on Jersey. There's a lovely, lovely familial warmth there that that really comes through. Obviously, there in your in in you having written the book, but you can sense that there as well. Oh, it's nice. It's not um, it, that wasn't something I tried to do deliberately. I think our family life was was pretty hard. And our dad, this is and this is not in the book, but my dad became an alcoholic when he was dealing with the, with with my mum getting ill. And Toby, I know, didn't want to mention that in this book. Um, so I haven't really put it in. Um, but that doesn't take away from the fact that we did create this very sort of close knit and we weren't in each other's business all the time really but just kind of looking out for each other making sure we we're okay a little bit like you do when you go with a group of people out kayaking or any other kind of adventure you just everyone's doing their own thing but you're always looking out to your left to your right you know are they, are they okay um is something going on with them whatever and I think that that's kind of the the approach that we had as a family was more like that than it wasn't kind of smothering lots of hugs and oh you know all of this which is fine but just wasn't how we grew up um but it was much more like okay we're all independent let's just get on with our stuff but just just check that person's all right 
And, and I love that analogy of, 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 of being out on a, on a kayak journey with other people. Because it is that, you know, the, 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 there were moments where, where, where Toby would say that, you know, he couldn't even see anyone because of the, the swell and stuff like that. And, and yeah. yet you were all in that adventure together. And I, 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 that's exactly what you're saying about your family. That's so beautiful and, and just a, a lovely way of, of of stitching it together. I think we'll, we'll talk a bit about you writing it in a minute, but I think you've got a real- I've talent. just thought of that though. And now I'm thinking you should have put that in the book, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Save it for the second one. Save it for yeah, the second yeah. one. <laughs> and, and I think, so I guess I took from that, that warm from familiarity and the, and, the, and the kayaking family, that Tony took, uh, Tony, Toby took that into his own kayaking family because he, he, he did seem to have a brilliant kayaking family that he just seemed to add to as he went on his journey. Yeah. Really. It was lovely, it really was. There was a, loads of human connections that bore him along, weren't there? Yeah, definitely. He, he decided in the beginning that this wasn't a one man and his kayak story. It was definitely, I mean, the story as he was making it, before he even thought of making it into a book, um, it was going to be about connection and it was going to be about that human connection and what what brings us together more than what tears us apart? And that could be on a political level in terms of Brexit um, and a connection across the seas. It could be historical, the connection across the seas that is to do with, you know, some countries like Ireland and Wales were more connected across the seas. People here on the east coast of Ireland were, were more connected across the seas than they were to people in Dublin um, because it was just easier to get across the sea. And he was really interested in that as well as just that kayaking family, as you put it, this kind of, hey, we've got this shared love of this sport or, well, kind of sport. We'll talk about that later in a minute as well. Um, and, um, and let's just bond over that and then other stuff. And um, he had a wonderful set of friends in London when he first started kayaking. And I think they, they really were brilliant support to him um, in the same way that that we was talking earlier that it's not that sort of are you okay like mothering it's just kind of like keep an eye out right haven't seen you down the club for a few days are you all right coming out let's go and have a beer or whatever it, whatever it was um so yeah I think there's definitely a, a there's definitely a kayaking family a sea kayaking family that I'm now getting to see a little bit as well but then Toby had his own kind of <laughs> sea kayaking family that was sort of close family let's say that's it's it's lovely that that, that was in his intent to to build that story of connection um yeah. because I, I think it i think it really comes through i have to ask have you have you or did he read a book called the frayed atlantic edge i've got it here i haven't read it um i've got it in my bag somewhere over here because i brought it with me to ireland it's, um, it's fabulous we featured it many years ago interview and david the author was one of the first yeah. authors that, that we interviewed it, it, it came right at the start of when when I, when I started doing interviews with authors and it's just one of those books that really sticks with me but he talks exactly about about that connection that, that the coastal areas all had in a in a time yeah. moved by the sea um and, and and he also talks about the incredible connection that he found when he when he turned up in a place by his by kayak you know he'd, he'd yeah. arrive on the on the shorefront and and he was sort of welcomed in a very different way than if someone had yeah. come in by the road and, and and i get a sense that, that that toby must have found that as well yeah he did i mean there were people he was already connecting to facebook is a big pool of connecting with kayakers and things but then there were a lot of instances where he just sort of rocked up somewhere and found people who then took him off on a little adventure or just welcomed them to their town. And, uh, and that was all around the shipping forecast from, from Southeast Iceland all the way down to the tip of Portugal, really. Um, and I'm thinking particularly of the, the part around Northern Spain, because that, was, that took him I think three and a half weeks and there's absolutely loads of footage and loads of stuff that didn't go into the book on that part because Toby was traveling mostly on his own there and just meeting people as he went along but by one way or another he sort of just 
landed, met people, got embroiled in another adventure, went off and did that, came back and continued round. Um, so yeah, it was that connection was was really important. And it definitely wasn't kayaking for him started because of connection. He was he had to go and take this helmet back to the um, to, to Tower Hamlets Canoe Club. And he, what he found was this group of people who were amazingly welcoming and were just sort of, oh, you don't really know how to kayak. Brilliant. Come on, we'll show you. Um, and that's, that's something that I've seen as well, just sort of starting out. But um, it's it's a really kind of special thing, I think. Mm. And, and, and and time after time, it seemed to take him into the, to, to some remarkable situation. I love the bit where where he, he meets the the, the 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 cool the cool surf girl and gets goes goes to the amazing house and he's like, you know, these people wouldn't look out of place in in, in London or or he's there <laughs> with Jesus, the, the the lighthouse astronomer. That, that that was that was that was incredible. Yeah, I mean that bit. I remember him sort of basically sending me I think it was WhatsApp but uh, yeah whatever he was sending a message I've just met Jesus in a lighthouse and um then we went to this blow up planetarium and I was just like what I don't <laughs> really understand what you're saying but you know eventually I, I figured it out um but yeah he absolutely loved that uh, and this was on the Atlantic islands of Galicia which I mean before I started trying to write the book I didn't even know where they were I didn't even know they existed to be honest so uh, yeah. well let, let's talk about you, before we talk about you writing the book i have to say obviously yeah. this is everyone's conversation so so i'm asking loads of questions if guys if you've got questions that you want to ask do chip in ask them in the chat i will i will feed them in um but equally i've got i've got plenty to ask katie we we, we could be here all night don't don't worry about <laughs> it. um yeah so so i was i was gonna ask actually if if he told you some of these well he must have told you some of these stories before any of this unfolded and, and, and you end up you end up writing the book. How did you feel about him being on the adventure and the, and the stories that he was telling you? Um, well, I remember when he left, so we went to the airport to see him off and it was it, it kind of made sense to me in the beginning, the whole idea of the trip, um, because I felt after our brother died that lots of things needed to change and for me I just had my first child so essentially my life was just like what the hell is going on I've got no idea but Toby's was pretty much the same and so it made sense that he wanted to go on this trip um the shipping forecast is obviously part of my childhood as well as his and that made sense as well and it was more kind of okay are you going to be okay are you going to be okay going on your own and Toby always played down some of the risky bits I think um the Faroe Islands, I remember when he went there, just thinking, I don't really know where they are. They I, they look like they're out in the middle of the sea and they look a bit dodgy, but he certainly was very selective about what he sent to me on email <laughs> or on WhatsApp. Um, and my view of the trip was sort of the, the really, spe you know, specific highlights of it. And because I'd got this very young child, I was not even following it as I would as a normal person and be you know on the Instagram and go oh where is he now what does it look like all of this I was like just trying to you know get my act together really um so I, I kind of got these little snippets and I, I could have told you more or less you know the route he did the sea areas some of the places he went to a couple of the stories but not a great deal of detail and I think that was one of the the wonderful things about writing the book was to be able to spend that time getting into what did he actually do um this was stuff that you know he told me stuff over a beer as well later but none not the detail of then I went here then I went around here and I met this person and um so it was it was like spending an extra year with him uh in a way and being able to understand in detail what he did um from what I already knew, I could just sort of go into loads more detail. And I had access to his phone, his computer, his um, notes, uh, his voice recordings. He had lots of handwritten notes. So it had loads and loads of material. Um, it was a case of trying to, first of all, put it all together in the right order, which wasn't always easy. Um, and then from there, once I'd got the story 
the, well, the facts clear and, and also sort of planned it out on um, Google Maps so that I knew that every night where he stayed um, and some of that I had to do looking at lighthouses and finding out where that lighthouse was from a photo and others I had geolocalization on the phone so that was much easier um, but yeah once I got all of that I was like okay now I can do it because I really wanted it to be properly non-fiction um, and not kind of fill in any holes with stuff that you know more or less I oh, just went around here I thought, well no I need to know where he where he camped and if possible what he ate and obviously who he was with and what the weather was doing and all of that information. Isn't that interesting because just as you were saying there about you had to piece it together and not and not include any fiction I was immediately yeah. I, I was immediately because you've got to do justice to his story but yeah. I, it reminded me actually of um a, a writer called Alex Roddy he, he, he wrote a book called The, the, the Father Shore where he, where he does the um the, the Cape Roth Trail around Scotland but yeah he, adds lots of bits of fiction into it because it's his own story and he's he's a writer and he wanted to expand on it and so there would yeah. be fictional bits but obviously when you're writing someone else's story you don't you don't have that license do you you've you, you've got to play it in a in a very different way that's that's very interesting isn't it yeah and I needed to know exactly what happened because I did also didn't know what he told other people so I could see on Instagram or Facebook if I trolled all the way back I can see what he was posting and that was a very good source of especially Facebook or his Facebook post was a very good source of knowing how he felt um so he didn't write notes about how he felt very often he wrote a lot of descriptive notes about what he was seeing um, the trip he went on, sometimes what he ate, obviously who he was with. He did voice recordings, which allowed me to get the um, conversations out. But there were some bits that I, I just needed to, you know, nail down and go, I can't make this up. Um, there were even from the editors, like when I was at the editing stage, I said, oh, we need more detail on this. I think I've got any more detail. I don't know where I'm going to get that from. And of course, I did then find it. Um, or I changed things around and took it out as a section because there was so much material um, that I had some leeway to be able to go, okay, well, let's just remove that entire section because I don't know for sure who was there and what he felt or whatever. So let's just get rid of it. Yeah. And, and, and you talk about that in quite a matter of fact sort of way. <laughs> but it wasn't. <laughs> I should have I should have said at the start um it's so powerful this story I, it really touched me it must have really touched you and um if I get through tonight without bursting into tears it's going to be difficult so so warning sure. for watching and, and 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 I don't I don't want to prompt you with that Katie but like you said there it was like spending another year with it and that yeah been wonderful and yet so hard at times yeah, I mean, I think that you, or certainly in my case, I, I sort of got used to it. Um, not the grief, but you, I, I started doing the book. Basically, I was, it was the, a few days after Toby died and some friends of his, Al, who's in the book, and Lindsay, who's also mentioned in the book, they'd come down to Cornwall because they were going to come down and see Toby and they missed him. And... So we went out after sort of mooching around, not knowing what to do. We went out for a walk on a on a headland near Rinsey, which is out on the Lizard or past the Lizard. Anyway, a beautiful Cornish headland. And we were just kind of chatting about things. We came across the southwest uh, coastal path and they were saying, oh, you know, this is this is where Rain and Wynne walked past when she was doing the salt path. And um, and then. I think it was Al who said, that's what I always imagined Toby's book would be like, a little bit like the salt path in that he was very keen on those very precise descriptions of things. And so they talked to me a bit about it. I haven't read it. And they were like, you know, you should, you, we should, we should definitely finish it's, it in the, in the conversation. It started off as we should finish it. And by the end of the conversation, it was like, you should finish it. <laughs> and finish it is, I should say here, write it because by the time I looked in his files on his computer, there was this really, you know, hopefully entitled file, which was MBGL. 
I was like, okay, this is where the manuscript is. Brilliant. I opened it up and it's completely empty. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe hadn't written any of it except for the proposal. Um, but I'll come back to that. Uh, what I was what I was trying to answer was the thing about it being difficult. So um, I didn't start going through all the stuff until March and he died in mid January and I wanted to get the house sorted out and deal with all of that. And then when I did, I found the sound recordings and I found um, his notebooks and he wrote handwritten notes. Um, every three days or so he'd write the notes and the first section of notes would be the day that he was on and then he'd sort of skip back to the beginning of the trip, the beginning of those three days. It took me ages to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> to try and string it together. But looking at those was very emotional because, you know, it's his handwriting, the handwriting I know from birthday cards and from, you know, I've all, I can't remember not knowing his handwriting. They also smelt of his house. Um, I just sort of put them in a bag, brought them over to Spain and then put them in this plastic box and sort of thought, well, I'll deal with that at some point. And so, yeah, the plastic box had sort of kept the smell in. Um, and it was really hard. And there were there were days when I just couldn't really do very much. And I one one day I remember downloading my WhatsApp conversation with him, all of it, and going through it, um, which I wanted to do. It started off because I wanted to find out, you know, when did he say that to me? How does that fit in the story? All of this. And it sort of turned into, was I good enough to him in the end, is sort of what I was searching for through the WhatsApp messages. And I think that my answer was as good as I could have been, um, which obviously had nothing to do with the book, but it's one of those tasks that I started off, it was to do with the book and it went down into, into something else. Um, and in the sound recordings, obviously the first time hearing his voice is, is really tough because he's not around anymore, but he still sounds like he's around. Um, and there's one where he's on this beach in Galicia and he's just, he, he just does this, it's about a 20 minute recording. He's lying on the back of the beach. It's quite stormy. He hasn't been able to launch the kayak for a few days. And he's lying on his mat, um, camping mat, looking up at the stars and just doing this recording about how he's felt on the beach, getting into the rhythm of the tides and the, and the wind and all of this. And he's looking up at these stars and goes, oh, look, a shooting star. And you can just see that or hear the joy in his voice at seeing that and imagine the whole thing. And at the end of it, he just goes, oh, I'm, I'm rambling on a bit now. I, I think I should just go to bed. And he, he ends it there, to which I immediately replied. It was quite late at night when I was listening to it. Oh, night, night, Toby. And then just burst into tears because, you know, he, he's not around anymore to have those kind of conversations with. Um, got me going. So it was, it was <laughs> it, it's a, I, I love that bit. I, I, I really, sorry. <laughs> I'll pull myself together, right? But I did. I loved that bit. It was beautiful, and like, like a moment that, that you never really get to experience in a book with, with your reflection on him and your connection with him. It was, it, it was wonderful to share it. So you know, thank you. That's, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I've, in a way, I wouldn't say become immune to it because I still find that you know there are days when when it, you know things are quite emotional uh, I find myself bursting into tears over something that I think I've sort of handled but I think that's the way grief works and you don't you just never you never trust it it's just there underneath <laughs> um but it has been in a way a therapy writing the book or certainly having the having the challenge of turning something ugly and difficult into something beautiful um I think that that for me has been without without making it superficial or dumbing down how difficult it can be to accompany someone who's um, got a life limiting or a, a terminal illness or is going through cancer or just some things are really hard and you know it doesn't feel good at the time and I think sometimes there's this 
this oh you should just put your happy what am I going to learn from this kind of glasses on so you know what don't do that just just live it and try and get through whatever way you can and for me I know that if there's this way that I can turn it into something create something from it that is uh, beautiful or different um then I'm going to feel a lot I'm going to feel a lot better about it and and in the case of the book obviously then it went through a load of other stages which is to make it um beautiful or um appealing to other people as well so but for me it was it was the project has been amazing as a way of dealing with grief but also thinking about where it's going and yeah making it just converting it into something else yeah um and I often thought of Toby you know obviously one of the things that kept me going with the book if, if I was writing this about myself on my own journey I'm not sure I would have finished it so quickly or done it so precisely <laughs> um because I I knew that I had the publishing contract and you know I can imagine that publishers you you, the person who was supposed to be writing the book dies you kind of think okay that's the end of the contract let's forget about it um I called them up a week after he died and said just please don't cancel it um and we had a whole conversation around it and thankfully Debbie who's a managing editor believed me <laughs> and just kept it on their books and then I sort of kept that idea that, okay, I need to meet that September deadline for handing in the first manuscript. And therefore I need to get on with this. It's not like an open-ended journey that could go on forever. Um, and so just move forward with it, allowing myself those days of crying or being upset, but then sort of making myself pick it up again and go, look, imagine the presenting this book imagine getting Toby's story out there because he really wanted his story to be told or well probably preferably to, for him to tell it himself um and, and there's no way he would have written such detailed notes I think if he wasn't planning on telling it one way or another and of course when he was doing the journey he didn't have a book contract so it was sort of like it could be a podcast it could be a book it, who knows <laughs> let's just see Mm. I mean, it, you, you don't talk a huge amount about it, but in the book you allude to, like, you've got a background in creativity and, and, and storytelling. Yeah. Can you expand on that a little as to how, because you've done a, an amazing job. Where, where did you develop those skills and how were you using them before you before you came to write the book? Yeah, I think I, um, I was always kind of deemed to be a creative person, cr the creative one in the family. Toby then kind of trumped that a little bit by being both creative and analytical. Um, but he was he was a bit of the star. Um, and so I started off there. I, di I did things like um, A-level art, A-level theatre studies, um, A-level English and English language and literature. So I, was, I already felt like I was quite at home in, in different arts. Um, and I've carried that through my professional life. I, I basically got into, I, I trained as a lawyer um, after studying drama and then went into communication. Um, so doing lots of corporate communication stuff, media relations, press relations, that kind of thing. Um, and then got myself an MBA and started going into more the business side where I um, switch my creativity more towards uh, training, training and coaching. And so I do a lot of training and coaching in storytelling, in creativity in general. Um, I'm a, a qualified expressive arts therapist, uh, which I mostly use in business, although I do have some uh, individual clients. And that's all about using the arts in order to overcome or deal with different things. Um, when I use that in business, I use the arts to develop creativity communication and leadership basically um and it's essentially the same thing and i think it's you know business has a lot it can learn from the arts so i've done a lot of teaching storytelling which isn't teaching people to write books um it's more teaching people to use a story structure to be able to explain what they've done so far or what they want to do um and a lot of that skill came in after I'd put together the book on what happened and everything's in the right order, all of Toby's descriptions, 
and sort of figured out, yeah, where I might need to add descriptions from photos or from videos or whatever. Um, then I could think about the story structure itself and that that would be the macro story structure and sort of what, what happens in the whole story arc of the book. But then in each of the chapters, writing them, thinking, how does that work? Because there's so much information. And I think the hardest thing in even telling your own stories is what do you leave out? And in Toby's case, I just had his memories of an entire day. And if, if they were my memories, I'd know which was the most important thing that happened that day. And it'd be the one thing I remembered. And maybe there's something that's really detailed in the notes, but I actually don't remember a few months later. Well, maybe that's less important. Whereas with his, I had no idea. And I kept thinking, how can I do this as close as possible to how Toby would have done it? And really in the beginning on the storytelling part, restricting my own creativity and sort of going, okay, what would Toby do? What do I think Toby would do all the time? Until I realized that I needed to have some freedom there and to go, okay, I've done the nonfiction part. I've, tried, I've been as faithful as possible to what has actually happened. Um, and what I can see that's happened and what other people have told me. I went through and interviewed everybody who's mentioned in the book as well. Um, and then from there, I needed to go, right, that's it. I'm just going to have to decide. Um, and it's going to have to be what most resonates with me, what I think might have resonated with Toby. But as I say at the end, this isn't the book Toby would have written. Um, but I think it's as, it's as close as I can get to it. it, it it's a brilliant job. And, and I was I was going to ask about like how you how you put yourselves into itself into his shoes because there's lots mm -hmm. of times where he's being very humble about things you know when he, he's talking to radio four when he says he's just mumbled through an answer or um mm -hmm. there's a great bit where, where so he the, the thing that he put in his churchill application the the, the grant that, that that helped him along the way is he said the project is about how active engagement with outdoor environments and physical challenges can help overcome personal adversity and how a curious approach can help deepen the experience. And like for you reading that, you must have been like, but it was so much more. But, <laughs> but, but like you've got to be true to what he's saying. And it was like, was it, you must have been tempted to have like editor's notes or something in there. Yeah, I mean, with that bit, one of the things I like about it is that I think when we dream up our adventures, they're not necessarily as big as we expect them to, or, uh, we, we, you know, we don't know what to expect. So you, you start going, oh, I'll just do this. And you've got no idea, you can plan it and plan it and do, but the, the joy I think of adventuring or having an adventurous or curious attitude to life is sort of going with the flow and going, all right, well, you know what? Um, now this has happened and now I'm interested in this as well. And since that person told me to go here, now I'm going over here and it's not on my original route, but who cares? It's a brilliant way forward. And I think that one of the reasons why I like that sort of very dry statement that is just directly quoted from his application is that that is the bit how it started. And from there, it became this sort of very human, very expansive, inclusive story um, where he sort of saw everything and did everything in a way. He did, didn't he? And that and, and, and that's the thing. It was incredibly expansive. Like it, it, it's almost like fractal in its nature. In that, in that things just kept unfolding and unfolding and unfolding. And it was, it was really, yeah, really, really, really quite, quite magical. But you know, he 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 committed in the end, didn't he? And and and. and Quit his job to, to 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 go and to go and put a real chunk of time into it, and that's yeah. uh, again, it's the it's that it, it's those big moments in life that propel us through, and and he he clearly recognised that he was in the midst of a of a big moment and needed to needed to make the most of it. Yeah, I think in his case as well, because he had the pressure of knowing that he, I mean, this is something we never talked about, by the way, um, knowing that his life was going to be limited. Um, and, you know, he didn't know at that stage, uh, 2019, he didn't know that he was only going to have two more years left. He could have imagined it because our other brother died at 38. So he was approaching 38 around then. Um, but there was this, there was an extra pressure, I think, on him there. 
um, when people would say, oh, you know, you could just, it's fine, you just keep doing it, you'll finish it in five years. And I think he was probably thinking in the back of his mind, well, I might not have five years. Um, so I want to get this done quicker than that. Um, and just, and then taking that big decision to leave work, obviously it's a, an important commitment to the project. Yeah, and there's, and there's so much in the book about about having time you know you, you know i loved I, I loved the dedication to those who didn't have their adventures curtailed may you find solace in delight in what you can do with the time that you have and yeah it took me quite a long time to think of that that's not that that dedication is is me hmm. um, and it, i'm looking at that i'm looking down here because i'm looking at it <laughs> um it took me a while to to phrase that in a way that was including a lot of people and you can include you know whatever curtails your adventures and and you know in my case in recent years it's been having a family that doesn't mean it's a negative it just means that that's curtailed my adventures a bit and what can I do in the time that I do have um and that's sort of one of the things that's pushed me forward to doing my own adventure which I know we'll come back to but um yeah, I think it's important that one of the things that Toby wanted to show was that even though you're perhaps told that you've got a life limiting illness, that you shouldn't do a load of things. At one point he was told he should not go outside. He shouldn't do all this stuff, he, you know, um, and he just took that decision to do it anyway, carefully, you know, as, as much as possible and getting all these checks done, getting all this screening done and looking after himself um but doing it anyway and I think there is a choice um whatever whatever situation you're in there's a there's at least a tiny choice and that choice might be getting up and looking out the window um and towards the end he couldn't really leave the house um and I think I say this in the last chapter when he goes out paddling when we took him we carried his boat down on New Year's Day um, he hadn't left the house for weeks, really, and yet he came down the stairs going, oh, I've got this, you know, I usually go out and do something on New Year's Day. And I was like, oh, okay, I was expecting to go, let's get the projector out and watch some of those GoPro films of you doing stuff on New Year's Day. He was like, oh, I was thinking I could go in the car. <laughs> I was just like, okay, brilliant, let's make this happen, um, because, you know, it's a bit of a risk, but the worst that could happen is that he ended up drowning in the in the river and it was quite clear he didn't have that much time left anyway um I'm not saying that would have been a really bad thing and I would have had to do a lot of explaining as to why this very sick person was in a kayak and um but I just thought you know what that if that happens then at least he went out and he you know enjoyed himself and so that attitude that he had continued right to the end and it became smaller and his his space was smaller where he could act but it's still there um and that was very inspiring to me to see that 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 he would just find these tiny adventures just what he could do in the time that he did have that's that's sort of where that that dedication came from um i didn't just want to dedicate it to people who were sick I didn't want to just dedicate it to people who were looking after people who were sick or who had Franconi anemia, or I just wanted it to be quite open. Yeah, it's wonderful and, uh, expansive and, and, and makes it, it makes everyone think. And I think lots of the books that we feature do that. And that's why we feature them because adventure helps you reconnect with yourself and, and what matters. And, and time after time in our books, we come across these pivotal moments in people's lives that that prove transformational but it's so unique to come across it in this context um it's a it's a real gift that that that, that, that toby's left us all and so you, you you said that you never you never really discussed his his illness but but clearly there's there's a lot of mindful reflection happening whilst he's paddling you know those long distances mm. Do you get the sense that he worked through it or do you get the sense that he 
work through it by not working through it, by immersing himself in that mechanical movement all the time. Yeah, I mean, here, the, and this is, I think you, I, you asked me a question earlier, which I didn't really answer, which is how could you put yourself in Toby's situation? Um, and here, I think I've, I can, I can infer from the way that we grew up and the way that we face challenges that he probably just had it in his mind and then used the the, the joy of being in nature or the challenge of, you know, the, some of the tough kayaking to distract himself in a way, but at the same time having it there kind of processing, almost like when your hard drive of your computer is kind of ticking away, you know, it's doing something in the background, but it's not necessarily on the screen. I think that's, that's sort of how he, how he dealt with it. And definitely those long journeys um, in beautiful surroundings, um, they, they sort of made him be in awe at nature and feeling small compared with what what's there and all the, the years that you can see in the rocks and, and all of that. So I think that might be quite comforting if you know that you don't have very much time um, to be able to be in a very special place, which is where most humans don't get to. Um, and then to be struggling at times with the sea. I think there's a moment uh, when conditions change and you have to just get on and battle through it and there were lots of moments in the book and in his journey when it was just about okay let's just keep paddling keep keep my skills going make it work um and get into land and so I think there was it's a bit of a mixture but I don't think he had it in the forefront of his mind I asked him actually when he was quite ill um when uh, we were just in the car you know you know when you're in a car with someone and it's dark and you're sitting next to each other it's a really good time to have those difficult conversations <laughs> because nobody can escape and um so I asked him whether when Marcus died he sort of felt he was next and we'd never we'd never discussed this I I felt that when Marcus died and when the pandemic came and I was in Spain Toby was in the UK and I knew that I could no longer travel and just thinking, oh, my God, I, I hope that nothing happens to Toby. Don't get ill now. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to see you. And I know that that's that's obviously very selfish. And there are plenty of other people who did have exactly that situation. But that was sort of really when it came into my mind that, OK, Toby will be next. And, and even when my my son Max was born, um, my son Jorentz has my other brother's name so Jorentz is called Jorentz Marcus and then his name that there's two names when Max was born which was in 2019 when Toby was just setting out uh to do this this sort of uh Brittany and the uh, Spanish part uh I considered giving him Toby's name but then thought okay well I don't want to do that in case it's kind of tempting fate you know and the reason Jorentz got Marcus's name was because he died but let's not so it came up a few times in my mind and but when I was in the car with him he just said well yeah it did and then I tried not to think about it um so I think trying not to think about it is it, it can be a way of getting forward and doing things um and he he also spoke quite often about looking forwards rather than back. I, I when I was training as a therapist and um, I'd sometimes speak to him about it and just say, oh, yeah, we're doing this. And, you know, I was thinking that when we were growing up, we didn't have a very easy time. And, you know, it was really hard with our dad and like all of this. And he just said to me at one point, Katie, I think sometimes it's better to just leave the past where it is and look forward. Um, and I think that's a little bit his attitude for dealing with his illness. Sorry, I went off on a. Yeah, no, no, it was it, it was a it was a lovely answer, and and took me to the reflection that that he had shared with him about doing the long journey and just doing it from one headland to the next. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's such a powerful technique in our in our lives, but all the more so when there's a physicality involved in it of literally you've got this incredible distance to go and you can barely yeah. see the headland over there in the in the mist but you know that well i'll get to that one and then i'll, I'll get to the next one and then and then we'll yeah. do it bit by bit 
I mean, I think there's just a, a thing to just keep going. I mean, it's it's like a resilience thing. One of the things I've been learning kayaking is when it gets a little bit scary, just keep paddling left, right, left, right, left, right, keep going. And eventually you get there. And it's the same thing. I, I took exactly the same approach with the book. I mean, you think about writing a book. I'd never, I'd, I'd thought about writing books, right? I'd, I always thought I would write a book, but not this book, not a book about sea kayaking. <laughs> um, and I never thought about the details of it. I, I, the longest thing I'd written was about 70,000 words. I'd done that in Spanish. That was my end of master's dissertation. Um, and, you know, isn't something that's publishable. And yet took on this challenge. And the way I found of doing it was just breaking it into small chunks and treating it like almost like essays. Um, and it was difficult because some chapters I had basically hard, well, basically no information. Um, and other chapters I had way too much information. So there were different ways of dealing with it. But that again is a bit like when you're on the sea or when you're on adventure, you know, sometimes just loads of stuff comes at you, whether that's weather or people or problems or, or whatever. And sometimes it's kind of easy. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it was easy when I didn't have any information. That was it was worrying in the beginning and I managed to kind of scratch around and find it. But I, lo I love I loved the way you were able to, to translate his experience that was there in the book into your own experience. And that's I, I think it's I think it's brilliant that you've gone. Well, actually, I'm going to pick up this adventure and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to carry on where where he left off. Was that when did when did you decide to do that? Was that an immediate thing? Um, no, no, this was in January this year. Um, and I, yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. I was just, I mean, I'm a little bit single-minded, right? When I've got my idea on, the goal is to get the book done. That's it, do not get distracted. That is the only thing you're doing. Um, so I, I kind of worked on that. And then um, I sent it in for the first edit and they came back with lots of editorial changes because basically the first part of it, I just sent in copies of Toby's blogs and tried to kind of ah, see if that works. And they came back and go, well, this all needs re rewriting. So I had um, from, that was in November. So November and December and part very early January, I just had to knuckle down and rewrite the first half of the book um, and go back and find all of the information and interview the people and all of that. Um, but once I'd done it and I'd, you know, sent in the manuscript, we'd put through all the changes and it, it had all been done. Um, I just felt like, oh, I really I'd really like to get outside now. I'd really, oh, kind of like my own adventure, really. I'm sick of sitting at my desk and doing this. And then I, I mean, it's kind of it sounds like a false thing, but it's sort of like a moment of and then it hit me. I have an adventure to finish. Um, and I started thinking, oh, well, maybe I could do it in a in a dinghy like I used to do dinghy sailing so I feel a bit more comfortable with that and um oh it's not really the challenge is it the challenge was to see kayak in all areas of the shipping forecast and so I kept this is sort of mulling over and my aunt came over on the anniversary of Toby's death she she visited Barcelona um basically and again it's family yeah, trade from yeah, yeah. Kayaking. yeah yeah exactly so neither of us said oh, great, come over because it's the anniversary of Toby's death. We didn't even mention it. Um, so, which I think is sort of partly British and partly our family, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I just picked her up from the airport. It was too late to go straight home. So we went to a tapas bar. And uh, once we got our beers and our tapas down, I was like, okay, Nikki, I'm thinking that I might finish Toby's journey. What do you think? And, you know, her, she immediately said, in a sea kayak, like, because I'd never been in one. Um, and I was like, yeah, you know, I've been thinking that people learn in all these places. And it's true that the ones that are missing um, are the west coast of Ireland, particularly, well, uh, the whole of Ireland, really. Um, and then Scotland, so basically Ireland and Scotland. And if you want to, in our case, I wanted to include a bit of Wales. And she just said, well, I don't see why not. Um, you know, as long as you're careful. And I started trying to figure it out. We just sat down and uh, with a notepad and I went, right, well, if I'm gonna do it, I think it needs to, there needs to be an end to this. It can't be, it's a bit like the book. And I guess I've maybe learned that from the book. Let's put a deadline on it because I don't want this to be sort of 
my entire life is finishing Toby's journey because maybe I might have my own journey at some point. <laughs> um, and the more I got into thinking about it, the more I realized it is my own journey. And the way that I do it will be very different to the way that Toby did his. Um, he's obviously, he was really no, exposed no, no, to no, pirate outfits then. Huh? No, no, no pirate outfits then. No, um, <laughs> no, no flying into places, no going to rock or rock. <laughs> uh, didn't even try Lundy. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of, I'm trying not to make it just a crap version of Toby's trip. Um, but the idea came about then and it sort of just started brewing and we and I just with with Nikki sat down and went okay well if I'm going to do this and I put a deadline of two years on it let's see um, how this might fit in and we started off, okay Lundy Toby finished in Lundy didn't finish it completely he'd written it as unfinished he'd said you know unfinished area and I thought well you know for me um, I went to university in Bristol. Bristol's quite a special place for me. So I'd quite like to start there. And it's kind of like a stamping my mark on it to go, okay, this is a city that's important for me. Let's let's start there. Um, but then I realized I needed to do that pretty quickly. So I started in um, the Bristol Channel in March, um, early March, and went out with a group of paddlers from there. Um, I picked the kayak up in Cornwall, put it on the blow up, on a blow up roof rack, and drove it up the the M5. Um, it was fine, and then just sort of continued from there and went over to did the Wales bit in uh, May, and now I'm here in Ireland, bagging some Irish areas, I guess. Uh, it was a bit chilly, yeah. It was a, it was a bit chilly in um, <laughs> in March and Nikki had got me in a sea kayak in January actually before she left she said let's just go I live in Barcelona but my partner's from Palamos which is just up the um, Costa Brava and the sea temperature at that point was 15 degrees and it was sunny so it was you know quite nice to go out I was like, that's kayaking larks good yeah. isn't it great and then I realized sort of booked in this thing with Bristol and as it came closer I was like right I'm going to decathlon to buy more layers of clothes <laughs> And ended up getting all these long johns and layers and layers and then put Toby's dry suit on top of everything. Um, and it was fine. I think it, there is that that adage, isn't there? There's not bad weather. It's um, it's bad clothing or something like that. Dress yeah. for it. And like, it, it's what Toby would have wanted for you, isn't it? The, it I, I really think <laughs> it must be. I think, I think it's kind of a leap in the imagination because um, he would have he would have been so happy that I'm doing it and that his kayak is going to the places that he couldn't go to. Um, at the same time, if I told him that, um, he wouldn't have believed it. And, it, you know, if I, I sometimes think if I told him I was, I'd write the book, would he have been happier? And I think he probably would have just worried more. He probably would have gone, don't take that on. That's, you know, that's just a really big burden. Who's worried about, as many people are who, are, who know they're coming to the end of life, he was worried about, how I would be, how I how I deal with stuff. And I was like, don't worry about me. I'll, I'll deal with that when I come to it. But he he was quite worried. And so if I'd have told him, oh, I'm going to finish the book and then I'm going to finish your journey. And at that point, he'd be like, <laughs> oh, just just relax, enjoy your kids, whatever. But now I think having in hindsight, if he could see what had happened, what's happened, I think he'd just be delighted. He'd be so happy that his story got told, and that also it kind of helped me to deal with. Uh, his death and that then I'm now kayaking around the copper coast of Ireland which has been this is I've been on a brilliant paddle today and you know it's not there's no bravado in it we just went looking at some really nice rocks it was quite calm <laughs> um on the way back it was a bit choppy I had to get my skills working a little bit but um it's just beautiful and I think he'd be really pleased that I've I've sort of ended up putting myself in that situation um, but yeah, he wouldn't have believed it. I think he would believe it. He believe it in terms of my uh, determination. I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure he would be absolutely delighted. I love that. So, so, so the, the, there's a description in, in, in there where where it seems to sum up what he wanted from me. And he says, "We all have challenges, but the important thing is how we deal with them." Not everyone will count the, sea, the, the shipping forecast, but maybe I can inspire others to focus on what they can do rather than what they can't. So there's a like as a, 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 a as an a, a, as an epitaph, as a as a thing that you leave to the world 
what a magnificent thing and 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 just you know thank you for thank you for making sure it got out there so he would oh. I, I know he would be delighted with the book and delighted with you with you carrying on the adventure it's been it, it, it's fabulous i really look forward to, to to hearing how the rest of it goes um thank you can i just say something a little bit about that that quote that you yeah, read that, that came from a note i found on his computer that he wrote about four days before he died and it's just called how does how does the story end um he'd, he'd started thinking because he was feeling it better he started thinking he might write the book and that quote was in there um and so i just took it and put it into the book there are quite a few that come directly from him but that's how he was thinking right at the end um and it's one of the things that sort of kept me motivated towards oh, let's get this done this is not just toby's book that a few of his mates will read it it, it could be something that could inspire a lot of people i i and, know it can i know it can it's 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 brilliant it and the, the the story's good the the story of the story is good the writing is amazing it's it, it it's just uh, it, it's just many layered and and every single one of those layers is magical and wonderful and we could have gone on for far too long. oh yeah <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even i didn't realize you'd been you'd, you'd been paddling today so so thank you so much for for, for giving give, giving us the time when <laughs> you probably wanted to be down the bar or in bed oh no I, I it's been great i've been looking forward to this actually because um when i found out about you i was like wow what an amazing club so you may find you're getting a spanish member uh pretty soon i didn't want to join and get, then get my own book but <laughs> now it's done <laughs> <laughs> oh well, 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 thank you, Katie. But you, genuinely, we we share these books to help people not just connect with the natural world. And we have, we've barely even talked about that. There's there's beautiful bits where, where where Toby talks about the gannets wheeling overhead and being able to smell the cities as he approaches them, and and like magical magical connections with with the natural world. But it's it's that's not just what it's about. It's about the connection we find with ourselves when when, when we take ourselves out of these four walls, get rid of the roofs, get rid of the doors, get rid of the windows, and just expose ourselves to the elements. And that's what Toby did beautifully. It was it, it's been an it's been a joy to read the book. It's been a joy to talk to you. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, it's it's it, it, it's been brilliant. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for coming along and to those of you watching it on recording as well. <laughs> Brilliant. We'll let you get off. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Bye. And we'll do it all again next month and the books will be on the way shortly. Bye everyone. <laughs> bye. Thanks very much. Bye bye.